Good afternoon. Welcome to our panel, which asks the question whether it's time to bring migrant worker programs under the control of the states. My name is Tom Lindsay, and I direct the Center for Tenth Amendment Action here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. This panel originates out of the following observation, and that is this, that the federal government has failed repeatedly to fix the legal immigration system or to prevent illegal immigration to the states. The question then that this panel will investigate is whether or not it's time for the states themselves to be given a freer hand to determine their own migration policies. This panel will discuss a proposal crafted by one of our panelists, Alex Narasta, which, which entails state-level legis state legislation that asks the federal government for a waiver to create a state-based migrant worker program under which states would regulate and control the entry of additional migrants into Texas for work or for any other economic activity, any other activity that the state wants to encourage and under the control of the state and not the federal government. Our first panelist, as I mentioned, is Alex Narasta. Alex is a policy analyst focusing on immigration at the Cato Institute. His popular publications have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today, Washington Post, Houston Chronicle, the LA Times, and others. He's also appeared on Fox News, Bloomberg, and numerous television and radio stations across the country. He's the co-author of the booklet titled Open Immigration, Yay and Nay, published in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Alex Narasta. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you to TPPF for uh, flying me out here today. Uh, yesterday when I woke up in Virginia, it was 12 degrees, so uh, it is very nice to come out here to uh, beautiful Texas. So I think it's important when we talk about, begin talking about immigration, to begin with what the current immigration system looks like in the United States. This map is a hyper-simplified, 35,000 foot view of a small portion of the legal immigration system currently. Essentially, there are four ways to enter this country legally. Um, they're uh, on a green card. One is to be closely related to an American. That's the closest, easiest way to do it. The second route is through being very highly skilled uh, and having sponsorship by an American company. Now, those numbers are limited to 140,000 every year. Only 7% can come from any one country. It costs firms between ten dollars and $35,000 to sponsor each individual person. It's very regulated, very controlled, doesn't work very well. The second mechanism is through the refugee program. I would not say you're very lucky if you're in that program because you had to be a refugee. And then the third program, and there's about 80,000 of those a year, and the third program is through something called diversity visa, diversity lottery. It's 50,000 people a year only from countries that don't send many immigrants to the U.S. So you're from China, India, Mexico. <clears throat> you have no hope to get into that program. You can't even sign up. If you're from the Central African Republic, though, or Tajikistan, you have a chance. If you notice, the one category that I did not mention was a low-skilled worker without family. There is no green card available if you are a low-skilled worker trying to come to this country legally. There is no green card available. Period. If we applied this system backwards in time to when most of our ancestors came here, virtually none of us would be here today, because virtually none of our ancestors fit into any of these categories. So that, I think, lays out where we stand right now with migration. So guest workers. What are guest workers? Temporary workers who come to the United States, work for a while, go back home, maybe return again in the future, go back, maybe on a circular system. The federal government currently has several of these programs in place but they don't work very well. 
for the typical reason that most government programs are horribly regulated, they cost too much, they're bureaucratic, they take years to get through, etc. My favorite example is the H-2A program, which is for seasonal agricultural workers to come here, work on a farm, go back home. Now it's only for a season, so if you have agricultural operations or a crop or you're, uh, you have a dairy farm that are year-round, you can't use this program at all. It's regulated by four different federal agencies, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of State, the Department of Labor, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It works about as well as you can imagine anything does when it's regulated by four federal agencies. Um, uh, it has a high minimum wage as required called the AEWR. It's seasonal only. It's very complicated. I've heard a story from somebody who turned in their form to hire H-2A workers. The bureaucrat folded it hamburger style. Uh, they were supposed to fold it hot dog style and it was rejected because of the way the paper was folded. So this is the type of system that we have currently. Uh, now what I suggest is that states be allowed to increase and to run their own state-based guest worker visa programs in addition to and parallel to any federal system. Now, we might disagree on this panel a lot about um, how to approach immigration, but I think all of us have devoted our lives to limited government, to supporting principles of liberty and free markets. So I think, uh, and putting this immigration system in the hands of the states, especially the state of Texas, to manage it. So no matter our other differences, I think we can agree on those propositions, uh, or at least we'll find out if we agree on them, but that's what I, uh, I think we agree on them going forward. So why do I want to do, why do I want to allow states to manage their own guest worker visa programs? One, because of what I just said, there are very few legal options to come here legally to the United States, and they're very complicated and unused. There is, however, high U.S. demand for these workers. The predictable result is uh, very uh, sophisticated and deep black markets in the United States with a large population of illegal immigrants. Since 1992, we've done a lot to try to enforce these rules um, on the border as well as in the interior of the United States. There has been a 500% increase in agents and patrol hours, for instance, along the uh, southwest border. Um, I argue that that has probably done something to reduce unauthorized immigration across the border. But what we really need to do is have better rules for legal migration so that we can channel these people from the black market to try to come into through the front door, through the legal market. Now, this idea of giving it to the states is not something that we invented at Cato. We took a look at other countries. Uh, not coincidentally, the two other big Anglo-Saxon countries that were founded by Britain that span continents and that have federal systems have state-based or provincial migration systems, Canada and Australia. So what I did was I took a look at these systems, took a look at the complaints, at the experiences, and tried to craft what an American program would look like. So what are the lessons from these programs? One, we need federal simplicity and simplicity on the federal level. State control, total state control over the terms of the visa as much as is possible. We do not need to apply any federal rules for wage or economic determinants on the visas themselves. Limit federal roles entirely to security and health and criminal and related concerns like that. Uh, and then wall off access to means-tested welfare. Um, that last point is already essentially in the law, but I think it can always be boosted for everybody at any time because I'm a libertarian. So how could it work? I wrote a bill with David Beer of the Niskanen Center in DC where we tried to sort of uh, create this system. So uh, the idea is to have the fed, federal government regulate the admission process, which is when they come into the United States. We can't really put that on the states, unfortunately, because of the way the Constitution, uh, uh, court cases have said that we have to do this. So feds would set the admissions, uh, and they'd set the number of visas by a formula, uh, an average of 5,000 per state to start, but adjusted upwards for population. So under our formula, every state would get 2,500 visas to begin with, but the state of Texas, because it has a higher population, would get 12,979 the first year of this program for the Texas government to decide how to um, put them into place. Essentially, the state would be the sponsor of these migrants. They would find and craft their own way to determine which migrants are needed. So they were taught to Texas businesses, Texas businesses would come to them, they take a look at the economy. However Texas wants to do it and figure it out, they figure out their own way to do it. Texas would then go to the federal government and say, we want to sponsor 
12,700 visas per year. We want these guys, these migrant workers working in these industries to do it. Federal government clear them for admission to the United States. They'd be cleared for admission to work in Texas, regulated by Texas laws, not by federal laws in this category, and they'd be allowed to work in Texas. Texas would then be allowed to sign interstate compacts with any other state. So theoretically, you could have Texas sign a compact with every other state in the country to share guest worker visas if they wanted to, or with no other states. Or Texas does not even have to participate in the program if they don't want to. Any type of worker, and in addition to the federal system, this would be for any type of worker the state wants. To give you an example, there is no visa now to allow a mid-skilled industrial worker who has, say, uh, who is a welder. You know, a middle skill, a pretty good skill, make a decent living, there's no federal visa for that. This allows, however, Texas to create one if they think they want one, or any other visa imaginable uh, to go forward. Now, the question on everybody's mind, I think a good one is, well, enforcement. How do we make sure that the enforcement portion of this works? Now, I think we focus too much in laws about how to allocate police resources or law enforcement resources centrally. So what we want to do is force this onto the states to figure out how to do enforcement better with a carrot and stick approach, trying to use the rules of economics. Positive incentive. For every, build this into the law. Every single year, when 97% or more of these guest workers follow the rules of the visa in the state, the state gets a 10% bump in the numbers for every year that they do this. It's an escalator program. And then combine that with a negative incentive. For every year that more than 3% of these workers violate the terms of their visas and escape to other states or something like that, cut their numbers in half the next year. And if they do that for uh, three years in a row, uh, then they are suspended by the from the program for five years. So that's a carrot and a stick approach. If states want to continue this program and want to make it work, they have an incentive to do so. If uh, they get rewarded by more visas, if they want them to comply with the program. If they don't comply, if they mess up, if the workers leave and go to other states, they get penalized by cutting them off of the program. If it turns out that every state messes up this program and it doesn't work, then the way that it's built into this mechanism, this formula, the program basically turns itself off after four years. It's done. It doesn't work. It's a pilot program built into the law. It doesn't require any other executive action. Now, what are the reasons for state-based visas? One is experiment. Federalism is one of the great mechanisms for experimentation on different programs. We saw that with welfare reform in Wisconsin. We've seen it with a lot of gun laws, with the proliferation of uh, concealed carry permits. Um, I, I hate that I have to have a permit to carry a gun. Uh, but it's better than not being able to, I guess. Um, and what we've seen in 2015, we saw a number of bills introduced in states, particularly in Texas and California, to try to create this different program. Now, looking at the details of these uh, different laws, in California program was entirely different from the Texas programs envisioned. Totally different. You had two different states, who basically the only things that they share in common are they share a border of Mexico, or the three things, they share a border of Mexico, very large economies that demand a lot of migrant workers, um, and they have a lot of Mexicans. That's basically like all they have in common. But they came up with very, very different things, very different ways of trying to deal with these programs. I'm convinced that if we had 50 different laboratories of democracy figuring out different ways to structure these and enforce them and make it work, we get a much, much better system than anything us boring people could do in Washington, D.C. State decisions, separate one related to that. State decisions are based on local conditions. Um, so for any economic reason that you want in the state of Texas, whatever you think, if you want them to be real estate investors, uh, entrepreneurs, those types of visas don't exist really on the federal system. Uh, you create that, you already have a state workforce commission that could be used to regulate this visa. You also get around the federal political deadlock. Uh, national one size fits all programs almost never work. That's basically the history of the federal government in the United States. So outsource that debate to the states. You have that debate on the state level. You figure out what works here. You can skip all this nonsense in Washington, DC. I don't know why you should have to listen to the concerns of somebody in California or New York when you have your own different concerns in Texas. I don't know why you should have to listen to them. Um, states can currently enforce immigration law a little bit more strictly than the feds do. I think we should allow them to liberalize it themselves also. More reasons? Republican states would be the biggest users of these programs in the long run. Uh, political incentives, uh, basically a lot of state representatives, state governments can take credit if the system works. They can also blame the feds if it doesn't. 
Also, on the federal level, it's the same thing. So political incentives work fine. I'm sorry, that's my most sort of uh, pessimistic view of it, uh, but uh, we gotta take that seriously. Also, I've talked to a lot of different people about this bill on Capitol Hill, a lot of these details, and one of the things they say is that they like the idea, they like the, the notion of pushing it off on the states. What they wanna see is states really move on it first. Now, over the years, this list of states, Colorado, Arizona, Utah, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, California, New Mexico, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Michigan, wide variety of states, every section of the country, have considered a state-based migration system in one way or another over the last decade. Some of them have introduced bills, some of them like Utah have passed a bill to try to do this, to ask the federal government for permission to run the system, because you will probably have to ask the feds for permission. The feds will probably have to go along with it. Uh, you could maybe get a waiver to do it, uh, but the feds will probably have to ask a law, uh, pass a law. But they're only gonna pass a law or consider it if they think you all want it. Now, nobody cares what Utah does. I like Utah, it's a great state, it's a beautiful state. People don't care because it's small. Texas does something everybody's gonna notice in the world. <laughs> it's gonna notice what Texas does in this system, in this innovative federalist system for trying to tackle this program. Conclusion, uh, a state-based migration system is uh, consistent with the principles of federalism that we all like, sort of limited government, pushing off a lot of these issues to the states and local officials. It's conservative, I think it looks backwards uh, into uh, America's past with federalism. It looks to what other countries with similar traditions have done to try to solve this problem, you know, through learning through experience, sort of an Edmund Burke way of learning uh, through the process instead of central planning. Uh, it's good for the economy. Uh, people disagree a lot about uh, immigration, but people who, um, the, the, the people who write a lot about the economics, it's pretty one-sided in terms of the benefits. Uh, but states need to lead the way. My one sort of recommendation uh, for Texas is to, for a bunch of potential lawmakers or stakeholders or other folks to get together, think through what their Texas migration system would look like, the types of workers, how it would be regulated, if you even want to regulate it on the state level, and write a detailed bill about that. And if that passes, then that tells the federal government, your government that you're interested in it, gives them a reason to consider it, and lets you know that if they ever do pass you, you can hit the ground running with this program to make it work. Um, everybody in DC will notice Texas, and I want to end with a quote from Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama. Uh, Senator Jeff Sessions is a fellow who is not um, at, uh, I disagree with him on immigration almost all the time, on almost everything, but he had a wonderful quote when he was talking about dealing with uh, Canada's immigration system. And uh, talking about the entirety of Canada's immigration system, he said he had occasion to talk with the Canadian official in charge of their immigration system, and he liked what they did. The provincial nomination program in Canada is the second largest source of migrant workers to Canada, equal to 14% of their annual flow. I think if somebody like Senator Jeff Sessions can uh, appreciate the, the logic or the structure of this, the central, the, the state control of it, the local control over something like this, I think we have a real shot of convincing a lot of people around the country that this is the right thing to do, and I think there's no better state to lead this charge than the state of Texas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Our next, our next panelist is Senator Bob Hall. Senator Hall is ranked by all the genuinely conservative Texas organizations at the very top. These organizations include Texans for Fiscal Responsibility, Texas Right to Life, Eagle Forum, Concerned Women for America of Texas. He graduated from the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina with a degree in electrical engineering and then received a regular commission as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force. He began his active duty as a systems engineer working to develop the Minuteman missile, during, Minuteman missile system during the Cold War at Norton Air Force Base in California, where he achieved the rank of captain. Please join me in welcoming Senator Hall. thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me to come talk on this subject. It is one that we worked on during the past session, working on in the interim, 
and by golly, I can assure you we'll be working on it in this next session coming up uh, for sure. Uh, I certainly uh, can't say that I talked about some differences. Um, I think I really kind of agree with the concept and most of a lot of what you had to say, with the exception that the one thing we have to do before we begin doing anything like that is to secure our border because there is no program that we, can, that we can possibly think of the controlling or having any way to make it work unless we begin with protecting the state of Texas from those that would enter here illegally. Because what Alex is talking about is a legal system of entry into the state. We, we currently have a number, although the system, I would agree, is broken, it is not working, and handing it off to the states uh, I think is an excellent idea. Uh, many more things we should bring back to the states, uh, and this would be one of them. Uh, the mechanism that uh, we had proposed and I think would dovetail with this is, a, is called an interstate compact. It's not a new idea. It's been around since the Constitution was written because it's included in the Constitution as a way for th states to get things done. It is simply created when two or more states join together by passing the same piece of legislation in their legislature and then taking that, that piece of legislation as their agreement to the Congress, which is simply the House of Representatives and the Senate. It does not include approval by the President. A simple majority vote in the House and a simple majority vote in the U.S. Senate and the interstate compact becomes law between two states and allows them to operate under that compact at the same level as federal law, which means we can then secure our border to protect the people of Texas. Now, some people say, but that's going to cost us a lot of money. Folks, it cost us a lot of money to not have a secure border to the tune of about $12 billion a year on our economy by people who are coming here illegally. What we need to do is have a secure border and manage who comes in and who comes out from a security standpoint. Uh, a guest worker program that uh, is just for that, I think will need to be moderated by the need for employment the only concern I would have there is that we don't push out potential workers that are citizens of the United States in favor of people who might work for a lower wage just to get the jobs filled. I think that's one thing we need to be careful about doing because it's one of the problems we have now is that people will come here and are willing to work for a lower wage uh, than, uh, than what a, a citizen, or they're able to get away with it. Uh, that's obvious by those organizations that promote open borders and free access to the country. Those that prey on people for, that will work for lower wages and takes, take advantage of them. In fact, I think it's one of the problems we have is the group of people who suffer the most from the way we allow illegal aliens in the country and to be used and abused uh, are the illegal aliens themselves. They have to live in the shadows. They really can't enjoy uh, the benefits of America like everyone can. And uh, it is allowing for one of the biggest human trafficking, sex trade, child pornography operations that there is, particularly the way the federal government has been managing the border. We found that a year and a half ago when uh, there were so many young people coming across the border that we ended up uh, with the federal government actually providing the transportation to get them from the border to the uh, uh, people who were managing sex trades in the cities up north and we were just facilitating it. And they were coming over and they have been instructed uh, how to address their where they came from and where they were going and so they just disappeared into America. Most of those have now disappeared and we now have thousands of more people coming in. Uh, in my district this past month, we had uh, almost a thousand, or not between Ellis County and my district, almost a thousand, 300 came into Rockwall and they were advertised as 
children in a refugee program and I visited the site and I didn't see anybody there that I thought was under 15 or 16 year old and some of them that looked like they could be very well could be 20 or 25 year old that were being provided three hot meals a day and a kitchen staff that was on standby 24 hours a day in case anyone got hungry a full medical facility set up at the operation. This is managed for 300 uh, young adults. And an emergency vehicle and a staff of four or five EMTs on standby 24 hours a day, seven days a week while they were there. And this operation was budgeted at $12.9 million for the thousand for 21 days. And when we ask, well, what happens at the end of 21 days, the answer we got, well, we're not real sure, but we're going to have to move them because state law doesn't allow us to stay here any more than 21 days. So they'd be moving on to another facility. Uh, we have an integration system in this country that is worse than broken. Broken is probably the kindest thing you could say about it. It is, it is beyond worse than broken counterproductive. Uh, and so it is incumbent upon us to step up with our responsibility. Now there are a lot of our, my fellow legislators will throw up their hands and say, that's the federal government's job is to protect our border. We have no business doing that. Well, folks, I will agree with completely. It is the federal government's job, but it's the responsibility of every elected position to protect the people that elect them. That is the job that the elect elected people have is the protection of the people. And if the federal government is not going to do its job, it is irresponsible of us as elected officials at the state level to just stand around and say, well, the federal government is not doing the job. I guess we just have to live with it. Absolutely not. We have a way to handle it, and that's an interstate compact. And it's irresponsible of us to not pass that bill to get the other states to join in with us, and there are other states that are working on this with us, and take control of our border. And once we do that, we can establish worker programs. We can establish who comes in and who doesn't for the benefit of the citizens of Texas. Because if we don't have a border, we don't have a country. We don't have a state. And so that's the first thing that we have to put in place is a border. And the cost to us in crime, in violence that's taken place, uh, is just enormous. Uh, I think the, the DPS number since 2008 is something in the order of 240,000 violent crimes that have been committed. And it's because we have an open border. It's because of the federal government's failure to stop people and, and send them back across the border. And it's no longer, and I'm not talking about just people coming from Mexico. That was three years ago, about 30% of, of those coming across the border were, were classified as uh, other than Mexican, OTM. Today, it's over 80% of those coming across the border are other than Mexican. They are Russian, they are Chinese, they are Pakistani, they're South American, they're coming from Yemen, other uh, Middle Eastern countries. We have found Al Qaeda manuals, training manuals in, in, near the border that have been lost. We have found Taliban documents, uh, passports from just about every Middle Eastern country. There are, there are folks that are coming across this border to do harm to our country. And it is our responsibility, if the federal government is not going to do it, to step up and do what needs to be done. Spending money on just additional personnel, like we passed in this, this past session. Now, I, the additional personnel, uh, the equipment they will buy, I think we can eventually use them. But until we get the authority to apprehend and take control of those that we catch that come here illegally, it's really just a big spending bill. Let me tell you, during the hearing, we had Border Patrol agents that testified. 
that the policy, at that time he said for six months, our policy has been that if someone in dealing in human trafficking is, ap is caught by the Border Patrol and they have fewer than six victims in tow, we turn them loose. We don't do anything, fewer than six. He said if we catch a drug dealer that's carrying less than 40 pounds of marijuana, 40 pounds of marijuana, we cut them loose. We just don't do anything. Folks, we put citizens in jail for a few ounces of marijuana, yet we're turning illegal aliens loose the 40 pounds of it. That was a letter verified by one of the uh, border volunteers who said, you know, I've been going down to the border and helping out as a volunteer for several years now, and until six months ago, every coyote that, we, that, was, that was dealing in human trafficking would have somewhere between 20 and 35 victims in tow. For the last six months, we haven't seen any that had more than five. They're not dumb people coming across, but they're not being stopped. And until we seal our border, until we get back to being a sovereign state that serves the citizens of Texas, I can't see looking at any kind of program that would be a guest worker program, although I will say I would agree with it, but they have to be in the proper order. Seal our borders, and then we can look at a guest worker program of some sort uh, to, to handle the needs if there are there. So with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Hall. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Representative Gilbert Pena. After becoming interested in local politics and government, Gil rose up as a noted community activist and eventually ran for state representative, where he beat the odds and won against a heavily funded incumbent. In November of 2014, he was elected to the Texas House to serve District 144. He graduated from Texas Southern University with a degree in political science. Please join me in welcoming, in welcoming Representative Pena. Well, I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to be asked to talk about my guest workers program bill that I introduced in uh, this past session. Now, and, um, the thing that I'm I'm not going to talk about securing a border. Uh, I know that that's next to impossible, as long as the federal government is the one trying to secure it. But uh, what I do want to talk about is when I was out there campaigning in my district, which I've been doing it since 2006, I ran into a lot of undocumented immigrants who were here. I've always asked them three questions. Why did you come to our country? I said, come to work. So you're getting underpaid. So it's better than zero, which is what I was getting in my country. Okay. The second question. Did you come to, did you plan to stay? No. I don't want to stay. I don't, I don't want to become an American citizen. I want to go back to my country. Are you going back to your country? My third question. No. There's nothing to go back to because I had, was forced to stay here because it was so hard to return to my home country. I was forced to stay here, working in the shadows, working in the backgrounds. I eventually brought over my family, my children. And they're grown up here. They're married here. My grandchildren are here. I have nothing to go back to. That is what we're doing to them. They don't want to become American citizens. They just want to work. So my guest workers permit was just find out what is it they want. They want to work. Now, and I noticed that he talked about, well, let's allow those that are electricians, or those who maybe drywall. Believe me, you ask Mexico for some drywall hangers, everybody in Mexico knows how to do drywall. No idea what drywall is, but everybody in Mexico know how to do it. The same thing as electricians. No idea what a wire net is, but 
Everybody in Mexico will know how to be an electrician. So you have to be careful as to what limits you're going to put as far as asking for a certain type of workers. And um, Senator Hall talked about a lot of these children that are coming in from, their, from these other countries south of our border, where the young kids, they're coming in, they're 12, 13, 14, 15. Anybody under 18 is, is a child in our country. But unfortunately, in their country, they're old enough to go to work. And they're not coming here to America to go to our schools. They're coming here to work. Their parents, their grandparents who were left back behind in their home country are saying, go to America and work because there's no work here and send money. And when they come to our borders, we detain them, we hold them, and then we turn them loose to foster care or something, and we put them in school. That's not what they came to do. But that's what uh, I've learned as, as I've campaigned in my neighborhood, which is 78% Hispanic, 68% of them undocumented, probably illegal, not able to vote. But they have children and grandchildren that can vote. And those are the people that more than likely voted for me. As I stated, I pulled a big upset up there. But uh, it, it was a learning experience to, to talk to these immigrants that, that are sitting there, you know, counting on, the, on, their, on the help from their children and grandchildren to keep them safe from being deported. If they're deported, they'll be back in a week or so because their children will go and pick them up at the border and bring them back. But, so my guest workers permit was just going to be simple, just give them what they want. They want to work, give them a work permit. Let them find a job wherever it is, whether it's cutting grass, washing dishes, working at some chemical plant or something. And let them return home, take their, their winnings with them, their earnings with them, because that's what they want to do. They want to go back home and visit their family, be with their family. They don't want to be here, but we are forcing them to be here with our laws that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pena. We're now ready to open it up uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, before we take uh, your questions in the audience, uh, first uh, want to extend the opportunity to any of our panelists. If you have any questions uh, of each other or, or comments uh, about each other's proposals, you're free to do that right now. Yeah, I'll make, a, uh, I think, a brief comment about uh, immigration. Uh, there are three times in the 20th century when the United States essentially eliminated illegal immigration. Three times. One was during the Great Depression when nobody wanted to come. The second was one during World War II when nobody wanted to come. And the third was during the 1950s and early 1960s when the United States created a guest worker visa program called the Bracero Program. At the beginning of that program, there were 2 million illegal Mexican immigrants in the United States working. 90% of them were legalized through that program to work temporarily. But more importantly, the annual cross-border flow, the numbers trying to come in each year, decreased by 95%. They did this at a time when they decreased the size of Border Patrol. They decreased it, and they controlled illegal immigration. Now, I think... One of the lessons of um, this time period is that the government cannot regulate a black market. I hate to admit that as a libertarian, but the government cannot regulate a black market. If we want to get a handle on a lot of these issues uh, with illegal immigration, we need to allow a lot of them to come lawfully, and I think that goes along with securing the border. I, don't, I think we can secure the, I think a legal migration program will allow us, allow law enforcement, allow Border Patrol, allow these folks uh, who work in immigration and customs enforcement and customs and border protection to actually get a handle on it. Because it will channel the would-be illegal immigrants into the legal system going forward. And I think that that is, uh, I don't think there's an either or. I don't think there's a really good order or an argument for doing an order. I think they're complementary, and I think that this is probably the most important chunk. I don't think we're too. I don't think we're too far off. Uh, I I think um, it's not just a. When I say secure the border, there there's more than just stopping at the border. It's also uh, 
eliminating, minimizing the magnets that draw here, people here. When you talk about people didn't come here, we didn't have the magnets in those days where we provided full health care, uh, all the social services and medical care and, and education and, and things like that that we're now providing that are magnets that draw people here. We have to relook at uh, the, uh, uh, the Piler dis, uh, decision that was made a number of years ago by, by a, I call it a rogue court that stood, which says that uh, uh, we have to educate anybody that's in the uh, stands on U.S. soil uh, and have, without regard to whether they contribute anything to society or not, we have to educate them. Well, that costs our education system a lot of money. We have to figure out a way to have an equitable financial uh, arrangement for, for people that we are educating. I'm not opposed to education, uh, but it it's throws it out of balance. Uh, we, we treat refugees coming into this country 10 times better than we treat our veterans. And I just witnessed that. I just described to you where we are providing to a group uh, three hot meals a day and an open kitchen where food is available 24-7 and medical services and transportation and, and education and, enter and entertainment for them. At the same time, we have a situation where we're losing more than a veteran a day to suicide. We have thousands and thousands of men and women who put their lives on the line for us and we ignore them. Here, here were refugees illegal, uh, that, that were here illegally and we have 24-7 medical services available to them. Go talk to a veteran and listen, have them list, tell you the months and months that they have to stand in line to see a doctor. So we, we have magnets that are drawing people here and that's part of securing our border is to eliminate the magnets also. Yes, one of the magnets that we probably have here that makes border crossing probably easy is that if you stop and think that the top selling retail stores, JCPenney's, Macy's, Sears, they're all along our border. A lot of the Mexicans that are coming across and saying, well, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going right here. Right here could be from here to the Walmart or from here to New York in Spanish, so you have to be more specific when you talk to them in Spanish. But our top retail stores are along the border, and they're not the only ones that are coming here, say, swim in the river or walking across the river, whatever you want to call it, or the ones that are smuggling in drugs or human trafficking, because 90% of the undocumented immigrants are walking across the international bridge. They're walking across. And like I stated, they're saying, where are you going? Well, I'm just going right here. In Spanish, that means from here to New York or from here to the store right across the bridge. So uh, securing a border means we're going to have to stop the, the drug smugglers, the human trafficking. That's what we're trying to stop. And that's what we need to focus on. And so if we just gave the people who, who are coming across saying, I just want to go work. I just want to go work. That would allow our border patrol more time to go after the drug smugglers and the human trafficking than wasting time detaining someone who's coming to work that's 12, 13 years old, and they're coming to work, and you're detaining them. And then you're, you're providing hot meals for them, and you're putting them into our schools. And when they don't, they don't want that, they just want to work. That's it. Questions from the audience? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Melanie? Oh, I'm sorry. Sir, you'll be next. You'll be next. Comments. Here's my question. What about 
once we say that we revamped our immigration laws and indeed Texas, we were allowed to be in charge of our borders. What is our tracking system like within Texas so that we can track the people who come over and the percentages and those who return or who become unaccounted for? So I'm going to give a very boring DC answer to that. Uh, so prepare thyself. Um, the answer is that is entirely up to the state of Texas. I mean, I think that Texas should be able to experiment with whatever type of system it wants to try, whether it's sort of making sure that these workers, when they get a new job, have to inform the state government of that job, whether there's some sort of electronic reporting system regulated by the Texas Workforce Commission. So each time one of these employers switches jobs, that's one way to do it. One of my, uh, one of the best um, uh, things we saw in the past was there was a temporary program during World War I for Mexicans to come up and work in the United States. And they could switch to any job they wanted. It was mostly in the Southwest, mostly Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, they could switch to any job they want. They just had to tell the federal government what job it was after they had done it at some point or another. So it was a reporting requirement. According to the stats from that time, so you got to take it with a grain of salt, 95% compliance, which is not bad. I mean, you're not going to have perfection for any human created system, like period. We need, to, our, uh, we need to argue amongst ourselves and discuss what we think an acceptable failure rate is. Like you are going to have people who come in and a handful of them will break the rules of this visa. Like that's, I'm going to tell you that right up front. Some of them are going to break these rules. That's why we built in the sort of our, our state, our federal system, the federal oversight of this. If more than 3% do in any year, we punish the states. And the reason why we punish the states for that by denying them future visas is to give them an incentive to experiment. Uh, I think you all in Texas are far smarter and more creative than anybody in the federal government at trying to come up with an enforcement program that works here in Texas better. Because what works in Texas better is not going to be what works in New York City. It's not going to be what works in Alaska. It's not going to be what works in Florida. But you need to figure out what works here. And this is where federalism can really help to try to figure this out. So those are a few ideas. But I'm sure you guys will come up with a better one. Yes, sir. I had a question. Maybe, Alex, you seem to know a lot about immigration law and history. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, you know, Charles Foster, is an immigration attorney in Houston, uh, Foster Kwan said one time that the, um, in 1968, we, I'm not sure, before that, 400 years, people came across the southern border, they'd go to an employer, uh, get a job, take a letter from the employer, go down to the, you know, the immigration, natural or wherever they went down to, they'd get a letter and a green card, be the only way to work legally and perhaps to citizenship. In 68, for reasons that are a little murky, that changed. Uh, and then, of course, we had a lot of, when you couldn't come across legal people, illegal, I mean, legally, people still came. In 86, of course, Reagan passed the, the rules that he did, did two things. He secured the border, and he didn't put up, what he didn't do is he didn't have a guest worker program. Yeah. And again, the effects of that uh, securing the border was uh, actually somewhat disastrous, because when we secured the border, like you said in your comments, and I think uh, Pena said, is that now people couldn't go back and forth. Before, when there wasn't work here, they'd go home and they'd come back and forth. And I, those, those seems like we created our own problem. And the way to resolve it is not to secure the border with force and walls. The way to secure the border is make everybody legal or that are here and then figure out a way to make it work-based, employer-driven. For 400 years, people came here because they wanted to. And now if we have an employer-mandated system where you have a job, you can come, I think that would work. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, I, com I completely agree, and I want to add a little bit to that history because I think it's fascinating. Prior to 1965, when you wanted to come here and work on a green card, there were some slots available. <laughs> what it did was, if you had an application to work, the Department of Labor could only veto your application if they thought you were here to undermine American wages or something like that. They could only say they could deny you if they thought you were. They didn't have to approve it. They didn't have to run a labor market test to see if you were. Post-1965, though, it flipped exactly opposite. Instead of them only vetoing applications, they had to approve every single one in minute detail, 
which means they went from rejecting about 20 green cards a year to rejecting upwards of 90%. So entire flip around. So then it went from the you could come legally pre-65 to afterwards you couldn't come legally. And ironically, the, 19, the Immigration Act of 1965, which a lot of people talk about as being bad, was actually the first law that restricted Mexican migration, that put quotas on Mexican migrants to the United States. Prior to that, there were no quotas on Mexican immigration. So that's an interesting tidbit. About the 1986 law, which was the Reagan amnesty program uh, that went into effect, um, the thing that they didn't put in there and that Reagan wanted quite a bit and talked about uh, was that he wanted to recreate a Bracero program so that people could come up, work legally, go back and forth. Um, during the 60s, uh, early 60s, a lot of um, Border Patrol personnel like General Swing, who was in charge of a lot of the INS programs at the time, uh, a lot of people on Capitol Hill wanted their cake and they wanted to eat it too, and they said, can you control illegal immigration without the guest worker program? And he gave his wishy-washy bureaucratic answer like four times, saying like, well, maybe this, maybe that. And they asked him a fifth time and he said, we can't do the impossible. We can't control illegal immigration to the border without a guest worker program because it's simply too many people trying to come illegally. We can't regulate that. We can't control that. The failure of the 86 program was that they did not create a guest worker program that worked. And what's also interesting in 86 with that, 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 that Reagan amnesty, prior to 1986, anybody could work in the United States. It was not illegal to work if you were an illegal immigrant. It was illegal to be here and they could deport you and remove you but it was not illegal to work. That was the first time they actually made it illegal to work if you were an unlawful immigrant in the United States. So the proliferation of that legal system up there is a relatively recent progressive and post-progressive era uh, creation. And I would argue that that is the reason why we have a lot of these problems um, here in the United States. Other questions? Um, hi. So I really appreciate the outside of the box thinking in terms of how to fix uh, the immigration system because I work with a lot of businesses and represent the private sector and bringing them to the immigration debate. Um, one of my questions is, um, having worked in the politics of immigration for a while, people in D.C. really benefit from this issue not being solved. So if that's the case, um, what is the likelihood that something like an interstate compact would be approved by the folks in D.C. when they benefit from the status quo? Well, I'll tag team that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not sure when you say the people in Washington. Uh, I do know that uh, it's, it's part of the president's agenda to uh, repopulate the United States. Uh, that is why he has expanded the refugee program the way he has and the way we will, it will continue to expand. Uh, but the interstate compact does not require the presidential approval. This is strictly the House and the Senate would have to approve it. And I am not sure I know of any way in which the House or the Senate, maybe Alex knows something different, benefits. It's this, this problem is... Their contribution to this problem is just their basic, uh, um, their basic brokenness. We have a Senate and a House that is absolutely broken and nothing can happen there. It's not that they benefit from it, it's just, just that they, they don't accomplish anything that's meaningful that helps the American people. So uh, I will say this, I think the Democratic Party benefits politically from having this issue continuing, especially the, the National Democratic Party. And my evidence for that is that they had control of both houses of Congress and the presidency in 2009 and 2010 when they could have done anything they wanted in immigration, and they didn't. They didn't touch it. They wasted their time on other stuff. Um, and then they lost for that other stuff, and they are continuing to sort of be in the wilderness, at least in Congress, in that regard. But they benefit politically. I'm from Southern California. I grew up in California. I witnessed in the mid-90s the GOP commit, if you could hand me the clicker real quick, I think I have this information, uh, the GOP uh, commit what I consider to be political suicide in that state um, by, well, I don't have it, but uh, essentially um, you had the fastest growing demographic in the state at the time, which was Hispanic Americans. You had a GOP that was very concerned about illegal immigration and not too careful about who they blamed. And they targeted folks for, I think, the wrong reason and a wrong campaign uh, that was 
pretty, pretty poorly timed. And uh, as a result, their support in statewide elections, just on the state level, from Hispanics dropped from about 47% to about 17%, and has stayed about that since. So I think you need to be, and, and they know this, like the national GOP I think is very familiar with this. And I think the state GOP in Texas has done a great job of trying to avoid those similar problems. I think Texas has the smartest state GOP in the country, California the dumbest, uh, based on how they've solely dealt with this entire issue, period. Um, and so the Republicans want to avoid it because it's damaging and could potentially very much hurt them. The great thing about this issue, about state-based guest worker visas, is if you are a congressman on Capitol Hill and you vote for this program, and if it works, you can take credit for it. If it doesn't work, you can blame the states. On the state level, if it works, you can take credit for it because you crafted and regulated the program yourself. You're concerned about workers and this stuff, you deal with that. You're concerned about the types of migrants and how they overstay, you deal with that. If it doesn't work, you blame the federal oversight. So like the political incentives for this type of, I think very carefully about political incentives because that is what drives policy more than anything else. More than ideals, more than the constitution, more than anything else. That's just a realistic approach to it. And this type of system pushing it off to the states because of the genius of federalism aligns those incentives to solving it better than I think any other program that we can think of. And whether we want to combine some more enforcement with it or a state compact, um, these are not at cross purposes. I think these are complementary ideas. I, I, I agree with what Alex is saying, uh, but the time is different. What I would, would say is that yes, for, for several years we had a Democrat controlled Senate, a Democrat controlled House, and a Democrat in the White House. And so they see the illegal aliens coming in as voters and refugees coming in as voters, and therefore they were reluctant to do or, or anxious to not do anything about it. But I believe now that we have uh, a majority of Republicans in the House and a majority of Republicans in the Senate, and we will soon have Ted Cruz in the White House that I think that there's a real good chance that we could get this through. Yes, sir. Uh, if Texas would go along with this program that uh, Cato proposes, what other states would you think would join in? So I, I think automatically these states up here would, uh, who have already shown interest uh, most of them would jump in immediately. Uh, Colorado, Arizona, Utah. Utah already has a law in the books for this type of proposal. Uh, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, California, New Mexico, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Michigan. I think most states haven't really considered it, and I've talked to a lot of different state legislators in different states across the country. A lot of them haven't really considered it because the feds don't really allow it. So there's a chicken and the egg problem, right? Nobody really wants to move first. Who wants to waste their time on something if the other side won't do anything? Um, but I think there's enough. So I, that's why I think pushing it off onto the states to act first on this gives it the best possibility of coming, becoming law. Because as uh, Senator Hall said, you know, a lot of this stuff on Capitol Hill is gridlocked. And this is a new idea for the United States. So... The laboratories of democracy, the 50 states, I think are better, one of them, and I think Texas should be the one because of its history, its economy, its conservative politics, because of everything about it, its growing economy especially, we should, you all should be the first ones to take this stab at it. That will send a message, and then every other state will take a look at it. For, uh, essentially, I think because the economic benefits are there, uh, within a couple years of this program becoming law, every state will participate. And I could see most states forming compacts with each other, especially on the north-south uh, law axis for agricultural workers to move with the crops. It seems it, it, again, to me again, we obviously need, are going to need a lot of help if we go into this thing. We need states with uh, a lot of population, Florida, California. Would California, you think, come in? 
Absolutely. Uh, in the last legislative session of California, Representative Luis uh, Alejo, who's from uh, Salinas, a Democrat, introduced a bill to create a state-based guest worker visa program for agricultural workers in California. Uh, his program is radically different from that proposed by uh, Representative Pena or other people. It's sort of a very totally different way of approaching it. Um, uh, but I think that they would be some of the first people, uh, one of the first states to follow Texas's lead and trying to, to get in on this. And the recent uh, increase in the refugee relo re relocation that's been taking place, we have, uh, I believe it's uh, 30 state governors have opposed the federal government's plan for refugee relocation. And so we have been working with, with uh, a number of states to modify our interstate compact for border security to include the issue of refugee relocation. They're very, very closely related. And that's gotten very good reception. And so at the legislative le level, we have begun the work with other states. And I would not expect that we would get to the point of having 30, but when you have 30 out there whose governor is, uh, governors are consistent with each other in opposition to the federal government, that, that greatly increases the chances of something like this being passed in the Congress uh, with, if it was presented. So we're looking at the interstate compact here to now include the refugee relocation management. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I do have a pertinent question, but I want to point out that that uh, roadmap you had up there, that immigrant roadmap, looks very much like the flow chart that Congressman Conaway presented to us at a town hall meeting for Obamacare. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just and, and, and just real quick on that. Yeah. Um, the immigration law is widely considered to be the second most complex part of American law after the income tax. Oh. <laughs> uh, my question is to uh, Senator Hall. How much is the federal government spending on controlling our border, and can Texas have that money if we are enforcing the border ourselves? I can't tell you how much they're spending, but it's like a lot of other things we, that are done. It's not how much money is being spended, spent. It's what's being done with the money and the policies. I think that what the federal government is spending out there, if they had the policy that were focused on securing our border, uh, we wouldn't have the issues we have. But it's, it's going to be more than just the border physical security aspect. It's going to be, because Alec, is, he's right, you, you're never going to get, I don't care what you do, you're not going to get 100%. Uh, in, in stopping people from coming in. But when you remove the incentives, as well as having the physical security and penalties, because I'm talking about, without getting into a lot of details, there are a lot of things we can do that would make it very, very discouraging for people to come on. Right now, it's like a candy store to folks. And I, you know, you can't blame them for coming across because we, we basically advertise, you know, uh, to bring them in. So it's a combination. And in the interstate compact, uh, we would look at, at going for a block grant, like very much like the concept with, with uh, taking over uh, Medicaid, with a block grant. Okay, go ahead and block grant that money to us. Let us decide how to use it. And, and just to piggyback off of that uh, uh, answer, one of the things we've worked on at Cato is the welfare state issue a lot. So we wrote this paper in 2013. The only people that we, we've ever, I've never come across a paper with similarly, it's called build a wall around the welfare state instead of around the country. <laughs> and the idea is taking a look at every single specific federal law and what needs to be changed to deny welfare benefits to non-citizens. Uh, turns out most of it is already there most places, but states can go further uh, than that because of state matching for a lot of these programs. So uh, just to give you like one example from 2013 in Texas, uh, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, uh, TANF, 
Um, there are some work requirements um, on the state code uh, in the law that you could tighten to already restrict non-citizen welfare access without doing any of this other stuff we've talked about. Now, you're not going to save a whole lot of money because a lot of welfare benefits in Texas, you know, they're not big in Texas to begin with. Um, and a lot of immigrants who are non-citizens just don't take advantage of them for a whole host of legal reasons and other reasons. But you could save, a, you know, maybe $100 million, $200 million. Uh, I have this estimate right here, $126 million total in 2013 if that law was changed. I think that's a small step um, that will um, save you all money. And, I mean, I, maybe it's just because I'm a libertarian, but I think we should get rid of welfare for everybody all the time. But... If we can only get rid of it for some people some of the time, well, I think we should do that too. And this is a really low-hanging fruit that you can take advantage of. I think if we, uh, we reduce the welfare benefits question. to illegal aliens coming here to the same level as what we give to our veterans, they'd stop coming. I, I have two questions. Uh, the, the magnet, you know, talk about magnets, but one of the magnets, it, what's the chances of it really being uh, Congress uh, voting to change the law about the you know, the, them coming across the border and having the baby, which makes them, uh, I'm wondering, you know, that's been debated a lot, but also the compact you're talking about, uh, what's to keep, if we have an Obama-like president or a Clinton-like president from just over, just overriding, just like what happened to Arizona? What's, what does the compact do that Arizona could not attain? Well, I your question is is a, a true concern because as long as we have people like what we have in the White House and we have in the Supreme Court that outright flat ignore the writing as it's the, the, a, a plain interpretation and inflict their own interpretation upon it, uh, we're never going to solve. The only way we're going to solve that is by the people we elect. It's the same it's the same argument that we have on those who want to have a constitutional convention or a convention of states or whatever it is to create a new constitution. Uh, we have a really, really good constitution that was divinely inspired, created by our founders in its original intent. And if that's the way we were interpreting the laws today based on the original intent, we wouldn't be having these discussions about having to change the constitution or about do, doing this. So what we have is the interpretation of it that has so perverted it we, that we can't even recognize what the original intent was. And it'll be the same with this. If we get an interstate compact and we have a president that wants to ignore what the law says, he'll ignore what the law says. And as long as we have a weak need Congress that won't do anything about it, then he will get away with doing that. Uh, but once passed, it becomes at the same level federal law, and it's not revocable until the states dissolve it. That's the way the law is. But what you're describing is a lawless president, and uh, that's something that's a whole new issue, another issue. I believe the first uh, part of your question was about birthright citizenship, about that. So what's the chance that Congress will revisit that idea? Uh, zero. <laughs> zero. Um, it is um, just looking at the polls right now, last poll I saw 70% of Republicans like the current birthright citizenship campaign. So uh, what, what the policy is. Um, the uh, consensus amongst all legal scholars who study this except for two um, is that the current interpretation is actually the legally correct one uh, based on the debates at the time of the 14th Amendment's passage, the debates over that language that was passed in the 1866 uh, Civil Rights Act, where the same language was in there. Uh, but that's legal mumbo-jumbo. I'm not a lawyer. I don't care about that kind of stuff. What I'm interested in is what are the effects of these laws? And one big difference between the United States and Europe in terms of immigration and the effect is we know immigration laws are never going to be perfectly enforced. There's always going to be some level of unlawful or illegal immigration, and some of them are going to have kids here. Um, in Europe, birthright citizenship does not exist anymore. 
Um, you have generations of people born in these countries from other places, third, sometimes fourth generation, who are not citizens of these countries. These people uh, in Japan, you have the same situation. Um, they are, gravitate toward crazy, radical political ideologies, whether it's communism or Islamism or anything else like that, because they are essentially legal and political outsiders in their own country. They can never be part of it. Uh, the United States and the descendants of people from the exact same countries that are in European countries have like none of those problems. By the second, third, I mean, just it doesn't show up. Or if it does, it's a handful of people here and there. Um, and I think a big part of why we don't um, is because being a citizen here helps with assimilation a lot. And it's the, un, and it's the unanticipated benefit. It's the, yeah, the Boston Marathon were two people who came here who were immigrants themselves, who were brought in as children who were radicalized when they grew up in the United States. That's two people. They were not uh, citizens at the time when they came to this country. They were not born here. The number of people who are born here who are engaged in that type of behavior is a very small number. Now, I'm concerned about that, and we should all be concerned about that, but the reason why we don't have the issues that Europe has, one of the reasons why, is because if you're born here, you're an American, the same laws apply. If you're in Japan, you can live there for five generations and not be Japanese. If you live in Germany, same thing if you're Turkish. If you live in France and you're Algerian, same thing. And I think that is part of the unanticipated, unexpected brilliance of our common law birthright citizenship traditions, which go back actually more than a thousand years. It's not the 14th Amendment that created it in terms of assimilation. So that's why I support the continuation of the current policy because of assimilation. I think it aids. It aids it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking our panelists.